that is a note because I have a power packed panel on today. And uh, today we're going to be discussing the secrets of success. In fact, Kaveri, I'll begin with you because you've written a book also on uh, successful women. Nena is also featured, featured in it uh, called No Regrets. So uh, Kaveri, um, quick, because we are also following the digital format. So quick, this thing is, uh, any regrets, uh, you know, in terms of you were the first woman editor of uh, India Today magazine, whole lot of firsts to your name also. So any regrets on the career path that you have chosen? Yeah, and I think the biggest regret is the imposter syndrome. I think that a lot of women face, and I certainly did. The idea that we're not good enough, you know. Uh, uh, the world tells us we are, but uh, we sort of have this self-doubt that, you know, um, maybe we're not good enough for this position, or maybe we've not earned uh, the struggle. Uh, so I think that was, uh, the biggest regret was not, uh, not understanding that this is something that I deserved. Uh, it came to me a little later, <laughs> but I think all good things come to you in time, and I guess... Uh, that's one of them. The second thing was, I think, and it follows from this, that I didn't learn to speak up enough. And I think that's something that Priya, you also used to tell me <laughs> when we were together in India today. And I think speaking up for yourself and standing up for yourself is something that uh, I learned uh, again a little later, but it's okay. I think uh, the reason I wrote the book was to tell people that these are the mistakes I made and I hope they don't make me. Uh, the same mistakes. So yes, that that's it. Thank you, Kaveri. And uh, Nena, you are you know featured in the book, and again uh, you you know first Indian woman uh, at Harvard, also at Rice Water House. Um, uh, what are the three things? If supposing I would ask you to advise an eighteen-year-old starting out in a career, what are the three uh, uh, things that you would tell her from your own life's learnings? Well, first and foremost is to dream big and not see the glass ceilings which in fact, for many of us, we see glass ceilings where they don't exist. And when you bump up against these ceilings, you realize that you can actually pierce through them. So to not see barriers, uh, and if they are there, then of course, to make sure that you can crack through them. A second is really to understand, and I think we hear that in the sports panel, that you do have to take on the relationships which hold you back. Uh, there are relationships which support you. Uh, the fathers, the husbands on that last panel with the sports uh, 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 ladies was fantastic because they were, were lucky they had that support system. But often it is the support system that should exist and doesn't the uncles, the aunts, the ones that prevail on the parents that say, what are you doing? As happened in my case, you know, you're wasting your money, uh, sending her off to study abroad, she won't come back, uh, you should be getting her married. And the good thing is, the more they said the, those things, the more determined I was to show them how wrong they were. So I think sometimes we have to grasp the naysayers and use that as a strength to show them how wrong they are. And I, so that's the society sort of uh, area. And the third is, as we also heard from the sports uh, ladies in the last panel, uh, that self-confidence and discipline, both of which mean hard work to make sure that you can achieve your dreams. Thank you. Uh, Shama, you're a spokesperson, uh, you know, a politician and a spokesperson. Now, today it's a very dangerous uh, thing to be a spokesperson, that to a woman spokesperson in the age of social media. So, how do you deal with the trolls? How do you, you know, uh, what are your, you know, uh, quick one or two things, uh, how to handle trolls? What is your guidebook? See, I don't have any particular guidebook. What I do is, when people go below the belt, I do not reply. I know what I am, I've always known. So I think you have that confidence in you to understand that they can go on with whatever they want to say, but you know what you are. So you just don't reply to below the belt people and uh, keep your chin up and know that you will fight the fight, come what may. And I think uh, very important is your self-confidence. When you believe in yourself, you know that you can do it. You know that whatever comes in your way, you're going to overcome those hurdles because you have a name and you will at a certain day do it. But of course, there will be hurdles and hard work and discipline. 
So what is the worst thing that someone has said to you on social media? Well, I'm always a jihadi. Jihadi. Okay. I mean, a spokesperson of the other party has called me a madrasa bred bigot on national television. I mean, what more after that, you know? So I had support system for my own party people hmm. who spoke against it and uh, my, 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 who, my party supported me in whatever measures I'm taking to fight that. I'm not just going to leave the person. I'm going to fight back on those certain things. In fact, we have a court of law. We, have, we can file cases. But uh, this has to stop just because somebody has a particular surname. Uh, you abuse them. And that is what I do not like because we are all Indians first. And don't judge the person by the surname. We have, I have always been an Indian. Uh, without, see, everybody has their prayers or whatever, your religion. I think it should be behind closed doors. It's between you and God. And I practice my religion just like she practices, you practice, or everybody else sitting there. But please do not uh, abuse me because of my surname. That is my uh, issue, basically. I just wanted to add here that it doesn't matter what your religion is. I've been called an Afghan anti-nationalist, so uh, <laughs> it really doesn't matter. Uh, people just go by your surname and assume things. So. As you, and it's usually the women who always come under fire more than the men. In fact, Shama, you are uh, we are very fortunate to have the head of the Congress uh, social media and digital uh, outreach also with us. Uh, but oh, she's uh, been called digital a lot of communications. Names, yeah, but, but she, she can give it back. Huh? She's a warrior. That's true. <laughs> um, uh, Shivalika, you um, you know also come uh, you know from uh, you head the Banshi Dalila Foundation. So you also come from a certain position of privilege and background. But you are also working amongst a lot of rural women, and uh, you go. I've you know. Um, spoken to you about the work you do on the ground. So how do you connect with them? What is the things that what you, you know, what really struck you when you first went out? What were the three things that really struck you that really need to be done? So Priya, at the ground level uh, the reality is uh, you know, it's just more challenging when it comes to empowerment. And as even people uh, on our panel here have mentioned, it's about self-belief. When you work on empowerment, you have to instill the self-belief in them so that their inner voice does not allow others to define them. And also, they can take control of their narrative. Now, to do that, uh, they are struggling with you know, an exasperated amount of uh, patriarchal norms, the outlook of society. And if they have to break that outlook, they need a support system. And we really need to work with them to work on three things. And that is support, sensitizing, and systemic change. But at the center of all this, we need to keep men. Because as we even heard on the sports panel, that until and unless the men were not supportive, and it doesn't matter whether they're part of your house or whether they're part of the community. Once they ha you have the buy-in from them, you can achieve that empowerment for women much faster. The second point that I would like to make is, you know, it's about giving them that confidence to say, I can have the ability to make informed and independent decisions. Because when they're able to do that, they will have the resilience and the adaptability to change things for themselves. And the last point being that when you work with them, empowerment will bring that intergenerational change, and that is what will make the narrative change. Okay. Nena, any, uh, you know, uh, now of course we see more and more women in the workforce, but you were, you know, uh, one of the pioneers. Um, any anecdotes of, uh, you know, instances of discrimination on gender basis? Uh, so, personally, no, uh, in that I was fortunate that I worked in uh, mainly multinational organizations which were, uh, if not uh, supportive entirely because I was uh, a bit of an anomaly, there weren't many women working in the companies then, but at least uh, there wasn't uh, discrimination overtly. However, I think it always behoves each of us as women in corporate careers to keep reminding the organization and the bosses about how good we are. So in the ideal system, that should not be required. I am really sad to see that even today, we still have in the organizations uh, the right hygiene factors Companies that will tick all the boxes in terms of what needs to be done. But 
is the environment in every one of our companies one which allows the woman to flourish, which is fair, that there's equal pay for equal jobs, and I'm sad to say, still not the case. So we have to continue to monitor this. Uh, there are people like myself who take this very seriously, work with companies to make sure that when you hire, when you promote, when you ensure the right environment in your organization for women to flourish, you have to keep everything you do should be through a gender lens to make sure that women can thrive. And sadly, we still live in a society where we will still have to discuss safety as an issue. Can a woman come freely to work? Organizations worry about that. Can a woman work on a night shift? Organizations don't permit night shifts. So these things are for us as policymakers and society to change so that corporates can also move ahead. Thank you. Kaveri, you know, there is uh, that old saying, behind every successful woman is a... I would really like you to complete that because I don't know how uh, staunchly men stand behind. They usually like to be in front. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, in my case, I've been lucky. Uh, uh, I have a very supportive husband. But uh, what I want to say here, and supportive uh, boys, uh, two very Thanks. supportive boys, yes. Uh, but here, I think uh, what is important is something I learned from uh, speaking to uh, Naina as well, that we don't ask for help when we need it. And I think treating uh, our family and friends as an extended support network sometimes is very important. And if you don't ask for help, you won't get it. And I think that's something that, again, I learned um, maybe a little late in life. But again, it's something that I'd like to tell people that, you know, ask your boss, ask your uh, family, ask your friends for support when you need it. Uh, even your aging white males who control uh, the system currently can actually be your allies. So uh, you have to learn to ask for help. And I think that comes from a sense of humility and knowing that you don't know everything. And I think that you should uh, keep in mind. Some statistics show that, you know, so this time the women voter has become very powerful and is coming out to vote. 66% as many as uh, men, women have also voted. But the representation in parliament is only 13%. Um, how difficult is it for women to get tickets? I mean, I'm not even going to the reservation. That's not that's too long and old a story. I don't think anybody buys it until it happens. So what works really, uh, you know, uh, what are the biases that women face? What, what are you told? Ke aap itna campaign nahi kar paayenge, you will not be able to give your all. What are the arguments they give you for not giving you a ticket? Well, it is difficult for a woman to get a ticket. I've experienced it myself. I mean, I come from a state where there are 51% women and there is no single member of parliament in that state. Woman, it's Kerala. So that's a shame. But uh, you see, my party, the Congress party, and I admire it, started the 33% reservation for women in Panchayati Raj because of Rajiv Gandhi today. We have a system in in, uh, in uh, states where the corporation elections or the municipal elections or the panchayati raj elect, panchayat elections, if this year a man is the candidate, the next time it has to be a woman. So it's now become 50% sort of way. And that's a great thing what we try to do. See, women are, for women empowerment, we need five ingredients. One is political independence, financial independence, access to education, equal opportunities and health care. Let's not forget the health part. Now, in access to education, as you know, south, we have better access. In the north, it's less, which we need to better off over there. In equal opportunities, let me tell you one thing very clear. Labor force participation of women in India is one of the worst. 2000, according to data, 2005 to 6, we had 48% of labor force participation. 2017 to 18, it's come down to 23%. So that itself is a problem. And in terms of, like you say, political uh, uh, freedom, we tried our best to pass a bill in 2010. You know that uh, Mrs. Gandhi and the UPA government wanted it at any cost, but we didn't have the majority. Let's understand that in the Lok Sabha. We had it in Rajya Sabha. But after 2014, my question was, it was in their manifesto, why didn't you pass it? And even when you pass it with a lot of caveats, you know, delimitation has to, why should delimitation?
representation ha should happen when women need to uh, be a representative why not with the same number of 543 we go ahead and give women the you know it could have been done in this election many But, of us would be yeah. sitting in parliament mm. but there are mindsets that have changed uh, you know uh, i i know we don't want to go into politics but uh, shivalika are you seeing a certain change even in rural households uh, you know the patriarchal mindset are women becoming more assertive i do believe the women are becoming more assertive but that's only after they have been given the platform of education and skills i also believe that you shouldn't only give them education and skills you must also empower them with life skills because skills without life skills is a hollow experience and at the same time i have seen that when you sensitize the men in the community and once they understand the benefit of this 50% underutilized human resource bringing in some financial uh, significance to the family they are very willing to support them as well so women therefore are able to get out and break those shackles and take things forward for themselves last uh, question for all of you how do you um, you know uh, feel in terms of uh, you know uh, what is the extra that women bring to the table at the place you know for instance i do a lot of shows uh, you know we do this show every week and now i'm seeing uh, now a women are very aware of being financially independent so they a lot of young girls say for us the priority is first work second children third marriage you know because of ivf and all the whole lot of options and society is opening up uh, as a woman uh, employee or a woman boss what is the extra that a woman brings that uh, you know where she scores over men for me for you uh, I think uh, the diversity at whether it's the top table or in the workforce is critical because it brings different viewpoints. Uh if you're a company in consumer products, can you really run it without understanding what half the population would like to buy? Uh if as was in my case when I became CEO of the bank, I had no women in my top team. i was presented a team which was all male look very similar and in the first year uh i made some big changes so that a one third of my team were women both from within and i had to hire from outside and the conversation at the table changed it changed because there was people who were challenging each other opinions ideas that diversity is so critical at any discussion hmm. at a leadership level that without it and without gender representation and i also think diversity across the country right you don't want everyone there looking the same and saying the same thing <laughs> kaveri last word to you on that one what is the extra that women bring that men uh, will have a difficulty I in matching up i, I, I think empathy men behave better as yeah. well yeah yeah <laughs> men behave women behave <laughs> men behave better men behave better okay that's a good one i think empathy i think no one can feel another's pain as much as a woman can and i think that's something that's very important it it allows you to lead a team better it allows you to have conversations that are difficult uh, that uh, maybe men don't want to engage with engage with because often they don't have the time or they don't see another's pain and suffering i think that's the most important i want and women also manage time better no so i just want to add to that is yeah. that uh, transparency women are much more transparent when they say they will do something they will do it men can say you know kal aaja parso but women are much more transparent when they want to if you look at administrations run by women in india yeah. they are much better than men let me tell you that uh, they we, run yeah. it like a machine because we are used to okay. multitasking discipline at home with the children you know we are used to all that i think so multitasking we can, we can manage time we manage men multiple talk things and women do and we <laughs> really do you know we walk the talk that's the okay. difference on that note thank you so much uh, for this conversation and thank you for uh, being here thank you so much for more such videos subscribe to the newsx youtube channel hit the bell icon